Welcome back to another episode of Two Wordsmiths and a Wolfhound. Tonight we will be talking about one of my favorite childhood books of all time, In the Keep of Time. But first, what wine do we have tonight, Chris? We have a marvelous Eos wine, which is a uh, 2019 Pinot Noir from California. I thought it would be particularly nice uh, because it's described as... Um, that this winery combines three of life's greatest pleasures, world-class wine, exquisite cuisine, and amazing experiences. And we seem to be known for all three of those. So I figured, Excellent. why not try some of this Eos Pinot Noir? And I believe this was a Christmas gift from one of my sons. It was indeed. So thank you, uh, whichever son. I believe it was perhaps... Uh, I, I think I'm not going to name him. He does not want to be shown on Facebook, and uh, so perhaps not named either, but he knows but to who him, he is. He knows who he is. Yeah. Very nice. I like that. It's very light. Yes. So I was thinking that we should try some mead tonight, that it would be great with a medieval book, but I didn't suggest it, so... <laughs> and here we are with a straight Pinot Noir. Noirs. <laughs> From 2019 instead of 1519. So, close enough. Close, <laughs> close enough. enough. 400 years. What's 500 years amongst friends? Right. Well, I'd like to talk about some of the books that we've published this year, or well, this last year actually. 2021 was an amazing year for us. And the first book that we have is this wonderful Tales of Things Beyond Our World. And Laura, what is this book about? Well, um, this is a book I kind of had fun writing. It's a collection of short stories. Typically I have done either full-length novels or I've done poetry. So I hit this right in the middle and did a collection of short stories. And they're all about sort of the supernatural. So um, there's, well, I have an excerpt from one of my longer books about time travel. There's a story about a legendary French preacher, um, somewhat like a werewolf, but there's some minor differences. Um, there are a couple of stories that Chris and I each wrote about an experience we had down when uh, in Missouri when my son graduated from boot camp from the army and we went into a wood and by a glade in a pool and the sun fell very fast and all of a sudden we had a very strange experience that made us both want to leave there very quickly. And when we did some research, we discovered that the Trail of Tears had passed right through that area and the people had almost invariably camped right on the bank of that pool where we were. And so we each thought, well, what specifically might have happened here that something is remaining? So um, there are a lot of stories in there just of things that are different, that are ghostly, that are time travel, that are mysterious and explained. So I had fun with that. Yes, indeed. Working backward in time, we also have this book, 2021, the poetry anthology, Startled by Love. And what will we find in here, Laura? Well, this is a collection. This is actually the third annual Gabriel's Horn anthology of new poetry in traditional forms. And so um, free form is very popular these days with poets, almost to the exclusion of sonnets, of villanelles, of triolets, of, oh, even limericks. And so every year I do call for submissions for the anthology of new poetry and traditional forms. And this year's theme was love. And so you will find poems about love, all, all forms of love, parental love, romantic love, love lost, anything to do with love. And the upcoming year uh, for 2022, the theme is laughter. So. so with if there were limericks in here, I'm guessing based on the theme, we wouldn't see something beginning with, with there once was KFC in a bucket. <laughs> well, there might have been a man from Nantucket. <laughs> and then uh, moving beyond that, 
we have your wonderful workbook here, The Four Spheres, Habits for a Better Life. And I find this book to be especially fascinating. It provides essentially kind of a universal, going back to even medieval times, idea of how you should organize principles of your life. And what would those principles be? Well, hopefully I can remember them. So philosophers have long said that there are four areas that make up our personality, our souls, our lives that we should engage in each day. And those are every day you should do something physical, something mental, something spiritual, and we'll something good for your emotions, and there something we go. that makes you emotionally happy. So... And it looks like the dog has come to join us. She this said, is our hey. wolfhound on Wordsmiths and a Wolfhound. Yep, you're, you're having a, a podcast and not including me. Who would have? <laughs> we knew you'd come over. And do you have our last book that we put out? I actually <laughs> grabbed two copies of the Supernatural <laughs> book. So the other book was our wonderful book of poetry and essays. And what was that book? It was called On Wings of Love and Light. And it's a collection of both poetry and essays on the topic of love, of what love really is all about, which often is not what's portrayed in movies and books. But things like self-sacrifice, um, you know, giving, serving, things like that. Yes. And it was a very wonderful book to, uh, to write with you. But this week, uh, aside from those books, we're also talking about the, In the Keep of Time. And um, we have, you know, uh, this book was, of course, uh, kind of seminal in your writing career uh, in terms of starting the Bluebells Chronicles uh, stories and has also been instrumental from the standpoint of you getting to meet the author uh, and other things as well. So... Uh, first of all, let's talk about what is the basic story of In the Keep of Time? Well, it's it's a very simple story in a lot of ways. It is just the story of four siblings in the 1970s who are sent to Scotland to live with their great aunt while their parents go to America for the summer. And they're not at all happy with this. They are city kids. They think that the country is going to be boring. They're four typical siblings who pretty much find their siblings annoying. They don't, the older kids don't want to be stuck taking care of the younger kids. There's nothing to do in the country, et cetera, and so forth. And their great aunt Grace happens to be the person who holds the key to Smail Home Tower. And Smail Home Tower actually exists. So this is, it's a very historically based book, although it's a children's mm -hmm. novel. And so they go into Smail Home Tower once or twice. And the second or third time they go in, the key seems to be shining. Uh, it seems to be silver instead, it's normal gray. And this time they go up the stairs and the whole tower is empty inside. It isn't today, but it was when the author Margaret Anderson knew it. And this is how she wrote the story. And so the kids in the 1970s go up these stairs and up to the fourth floor and their sister Ollie wiggles through the grate up there and falls four floors. And they race down to find her and all of a sudden it's dark and this lower room is full of cattle and they have emerged into the wrong century i believe into i think the date is uh 1460 it's in my notes which i can't actually read <laughs> but uh something like that 1460 and so it's a story of time travel and it's the story of how these kids deal with the fact that they are now amongst this medieval laird and his family who don't know them, who are suspicious of them, of the battle going on around them, um, all these things that happen. And then what happens, um, there's a key detail here. They do find their sister, but she's dressed in medieval clothes and everybody is calling her, I believe it's um, May. Their sister's name was Ollie, but everybody is now calling her May and saying she's the daughter of Mucklemuth Meg. And so this May makes the crossing back with them into their own time, but she doesn't become Ollie again. And um, later they once again disappear into another time, which they realize, um, I don't want to give spoilers, but it's not what they think it is. And so it's, it's a fascinating tale of time travel and it's, you know, wonderful, simple writing that kids can enjoy, but even as an adult, I've enjoyed rereading this book. 
several times as an adult. And what was it that appealed to you so much about this book? Um, you know, it was part of it was the mystery, this amazing tale of disappearing into another time. Part of it was the history because it's a very historical book. It's um, and you and I have been to some of the mm -hmm. places there. I've been to some of the places in this book. Um, part of it was that it was this amazing story of these four children finding this world, both in the country and in this other time they disappear into, that is so completely different from everything they've ever known. So it's a very, um, it's a learning experience for them. And then there's also a bit of this tale of redemption when they lose their sister Ollie and they come back with May and... By the end of the summer, they've gone from these four sort of typical kids who are just annoyed with each other all the time to really becoming a very cohesive, loving family unit. And that is very appealing. I can imagine. And I know from having visited Smell Home with you and having it turned into a bit of a tourist attraction now, some of the interesting aspects of these types of, of attractions, if you will, in Scotland and Ireland, I go back to a trip I took to Ireland where Many of the people that were native born there referred to castles as ABC, another bloody castle. They're all over the place uh, and you have to preserve them historically and things like that. The other interesting thing I found in Scotland was that you can go across private property. You can open a fence, go across the property and visit um, the archeological site that might be there. All of that I found to be very interesting given how we might treat private property in this country. Mm -hmm. So what is some of the actual history um, that is behind the book? So here's where I need to be able to actually read my notes because <laughs> I know it. I just won't remember to say it all. So um, Smell Home Tower I is <laughs> the Smell Home Tower is one of the it's the key place in the book, and it does exist. It was built, I believe, in the 1400s, if I remember correctly, and it was in the 70s exactly as margaret anderson described it but it has since been built up they've refurbished it they've put in all the floors that were missing in the 70s they've put in displays of its history things like that so it was a 15th century tower house and so it's very long and tall and square and narrow and back in the days of Margaret Anderson's parents, couples used to go up those stairs and climb out on the roof and they would court there. And so um, that's one of the stories that Margaret told me when I visited her was how her parents were among those who would climb up and go out on this roof and just sit there all night talking. And so this place is um, very personal to her too. And uh, she describes in the book that there's a fireplace with a, a carving of a man's head on it. And this too exists, it's real. So let me see, Kelso, the, the book revolves around um, the Abbey at Kelso. In addition to Smell Home, we have been to Kelso and it's a medieval town, the Abbey did exist. Um, what else? <laughs> the dogs in my life, I can't see. <laughs> um, it talks about things like the cattle raids between the clans and between mm -hmm. the English, and that's a major event that's going on when these four siblings arrive there. It talks about King James of the Fiery Face, who was James II of Scotland, and he died in 1460. So yes, the kids got there in the year 1460, I think it said 1490 before. Um, and he's a fascinating figure. He was entranced with new technology, which included these cannons that were not well known yet, or I shouldn't say, I, I don't know how well known they were, but they weren't quite as common then in 1460 as they would be. And so James II was attacking Roxborough Castle. And this is an event that's in the book that they meet a boy named Cedric who lives in the Abbey. And Cedric has all these ideas of nobility and fighting in battle and glory. And I won't give away what happens, but the oldest brother, Andrew, does end up going to the Battle of Roxborough. And Cedric is there. And he does see the event where James II's cannon, his brand new cannon that he's so proud of, 
that he's going to attack Roxburgh Castle with, this cannon blows up and kills James of the Fiery Face. And just as a side note, I should explain the reason he's called this is because James II of Scotland was born with a big, um, probably what would be a port wine stain on most or all of one side of his face. And so that's why he had that moniker. And I'm going to go let the dog out at the Wolfhound part of the show while you ask the next question. <laughs> And so I remember when you said about the first floor all of a sudden being invaded with cattle, and I thought, in this kind of a story, that's a lot of bulls. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Of course not. I should have. You never do. Knowing right. you. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition <laughs> or the cattle on the first floor. And then the second thing I, I remember from the story is this idea of courting on the roof. And I uh, very much enjoyed taking you to that castle. Too. That was a wonderful trip. Um, was that the same trip? There, there were a lot of cattle involved in that trip. Um, let me see. We were surrounded by the cattle at the Standing Stones. Yes. We were uh, surrounded by the cattle when we left the castle where... Cambus Kenneth. Cambus Kenneth. On Firth the Fourth. Is that where James the Third is buried? Mm -hmm. I think you might be I, right. I believe it's James mm -hmm. III is buried. We went into this castle and uh, looked around the grounds and the cemetery. And when we came out, there was a big stretch of lawn full of cattle, including a huge bull with a big ring in its nose and lots of calves. <laughs> and we were scared for our very souls as um, we were well, in the Standing Stones as you, well. You can be honest, I was scared. <laughs> you were mocking me. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, except for the evidence of the fingernail mm -hmm. uh, scars, which I have on my arm. So I'm apart from this, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, they're kind of long-term. So apart from the story, what were the real lessons of this book? Well, and again, you know, I, I hate to be looking at my notes all the time, but there are a lot of important lessons and I don't want to forget any of them. So um, one of the big things that I think I, as a child, and even as an adult, you can appreciate the lessons about human nature in this book. So, for instance, um, Andrew, the oldest sibling, expects certain things from um, these adventures, this battle. He learns something very profound and difficult at the Battle for Roxburgh. Um, we learn about how these siblings don't appreciate each other. We learn something about maybe how easy our modern lives are and they're all consumed with their friends and going to movies and um, going to their dance or gymnastics lessons, whatever it is they do in the city. And all of a sudden they're thrown into a world where men are coming home from battle injured and dying. Mm. And they start to really think about what matters in life. You know, it's, it's a profound lesson at that age. Um, we learn about this fascinating character named Mucklemuth Meg, and it's a fantastic scene. In fact, let me open to this page. I want to just read it. Um, if I, um, Mucklemuth Meg is called this. It's um, a term for someone born with a hair clip, or not a hair clip, a hair, hair lip, hair lip, right? Uh, I think you were born when, with hair clips. <laughs> I think I wasn't. I always lose them anyway. So um, she was born with a hair lip, and she's the daughter of the Laird. And not surprisingly, nobody wants to marry poor Mucklemuth Meg. So uh, seven years ago, the Maxwell sent a big raiding party up this way. That happens all the time, of course. The thieving lot these Maxwells are. Robert Maxwell, always a mite bolder than the rest, came right to our very door and stole one of our cows. It was his great mistake to choose one that was more stubborn than all the rest. And although the man has cunning and guile, he did not get away with it. He was caught and brought before the Laird, Red Hepburn, um, who actually historically was not the one who was the Laird, but that's one of the minor uh, Anachronisms, not factual, right? right. The penalty for stealing another man's sheep or cow is hanging. But Laird Hepburn saw that this was a fine, upstanding man 
And it seemed a pity that he should hang, for Hepburn had a daughter that was in need of a husband. His oldest daughter, Meg, was a kindly girl, but, well, you have seen her. She had never found a suitor. So the Laird called Maxwell before him and said that his life would be spared if he would swear loyalty to the Hepburns and wed his eldest daughter. Maxwell agreed to the deal. Mm. However, do you see what's coming here? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet. When Mucklemuth Meg was called out, the bridegroom took one look at the poor plain girl and said, I'd rather hang. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> So the gallows were erected, and a crowd gathered, and Maxwell was led out to his death. He took one look at the gallows, and another look at the lass, and now she did not look quite so bad. So he said, I'll take the girl. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is one of the things we learn um, about how... What, what it is to be born into a day and age where you don't have surgery to fix this horrible mm -hmm. deformity, how people are going to judge you. They're not going to look at your character, your heart, your soul. And, you know, I'm sure that's the same today. It's, I think it's human nature, unfortunately, that we find it easier to look for the good and people who look good. And we find it a little harder to see past you know very serious physical things so that's and we learned that meg mucklemuth meg is this wonderful beautiful mother too um let's see we learn about love you know he goes into this thinking that she's just this person who is so hideous he'd rather die than marry her and yet over the next seven years, by the time Andrew, Eleanor, um, Ian, and Ollie meet Mucklemuth, Meg, and her daughter, they have developed this real love for each other that he was kind of forced into this, you know, marry her or die. And he finds that he really loves her and they have this beautiful, wonderful life together. That's awesome. You got to meet Margaret Atwood, uh, excuse me, Anderson, yeah. the uh, author of In the Keep of Time. What drove you to do that, to go meet her? Well, it's an interesting story. Um, it actually started because you and I were at Smell Home and mm -hmm. somehow or other in discussing why we're at Smell Home with one of the employees, it did come up that I came there specifically because I had read this story in the Keep of Time. And he said, oh, you know, you're not the first person to tell me that. I've had other people tell me they're here because of that book, and I know nothing about it. And so one way and another, it drove me to do some looking. I was thinking, well, Margaret Anderson wrote this book somewhere back in the 70s. I think I, think I read it around 75 or 76. Hmm. And... I started doing some looking and I found out, you know, despite the fact that this is 30, 40 years later, she's alive and well. And um, this employee was actually interested in talking to me about, well, how do you think we could get her books here? So I found that she had a website. I found she had contact information and I was bold and I sent her an email saying, hey, you know, I was at Smell Home because of your book, and I talked to this employee, and they'd love to have your books at Smell Home. And so that kind of got the conversation going. And a couple years later, you know, it, the, the contact kind of dropped off pretty quickly. But I thought, well, you know, she's there. Why don't I just send her an email and say, if I happen to be in Oregon, because, you know, I used to live in Washington. I, I could just happen to be in that area. Could I meet you for lunch? And I was shocked to get um, six days later. It took six days. And all of a sudden, I had an email back from her, which surprised me. I didn't really necessarily expect to hear anything back from a famous author. Um, and... What surprised me even more was she apologized for taking so long to write to me and said the reason it took me so long was because I was reading more books and loving them. And she not only said, yes, we could get together, she actually invited me to her home. Well, tell me about that visit then to her home. So, um, it was amazing. <laughs> um, 
she lives way out, um, out outside of uh, a town in Oregon, and she's from Scotland. So it's an interesting story how she ended up there, but it explains why her books are set in Scotland. And uh, she invited me and my friend in, and she had lunch prepared for us, and took us all around her property. We sat in her front room and we talked quite a lot about her books and her daughter was there. So she has four children, just like, you know, the four in the, the book. And her daughter actually has helped her with some of the writing. And so was showing me all these other books that she's written, showed us the gardens, the meal that she prepared for us. She has extensive gardens. And so a big part of the lunch we ate was all her vegetables and salad that she grew herself. And um, you can actually read more about this visit. I have a three part series on uh, at bluebellstrilogy.blogspot.com. And so if you would like to read about it, you can go there and type in meeting Margaret. And I think we'll find out a little bit more about her after we let the dog out again. And so tell us a bit more about your visit to Margaret Anderson's house. Well, I learned a lot about her. It was just wonderful to, to learn about this person who I knew only as the author of In the Keep of Time. Turned out that she actually was a young child during World War II. So she writes in other books about children being evacuated from the cities. Um, she is very highly educated, so it would be, I guess, if she was a child in the 40s, you know, she was in college maybe in the 50s, something like that, and I believe she was trained as a geneticist, and she ended up marrying a man who was an entomologist, and so she's done some really interesting work writing a lot of nonfiction for children, too, about bugs, about insects. She was telling me how she goes to read to children at schools and she wears these actual larva earrings that are actual larva. And then she told me a very funny story about how she used to help her husband, who was a professor of entomology at a, at a college in Oregon. She would help him by typing up lists of bugs and things. And so when she was writing some of her science fiction, again, for children, she couldn't think of names, so she went to the bug list and took names of actual insects. And so she told me how one day she was, I don't know if she was reading the book somewhere or something like that, and a man came up to her, he's like, I know where you got the name of that character. But he was one of the few who ever realized that's where the names of her characters were coming from. You know, I have to say, it's always bugged me, the relationship <laughs> between the word etymology and entomology. Uh, see, it was a linguistic joke. There. That was, that was good. Mm -hmm. Right. So what other books has Margaret Anderson written? Um, and here, again, I go to my list so I don't forget. Um, she has a fascinating array of books. And again, some of them are nonfiction. She was hired by educational companies to write actually books on history, books on insects. For kids so a, a few in specific here she has one called searching for shona and it's about two girls who switch places and it does take place during these evacuations of children in world war ii and a girl named shona who's very wealthy meets a poorer girl who looks just like her it's a bit of a prince and the pauper story and they decide to switch places and so um, I forget, I think Shona is the name of the poor girl. Shona gets sent to the rich relatives in Canada for protection. And the rich girl ends up going to where the orphans are being evacuated. And I believe we have a dog who's very desperate to get in again. So again, what else has Margaret Anderson written? Um, so another of her books is called From a Faraway Place that's more or less a bit of a memoir about some of her growing up if I remember correctly. I did want to have these to show but as we moved in and some of our stuff is still in boxes, uh, she gave me a complete set or close to a complete set of her books. Signed them and everything and I can't find them right now unfortunately. 
Um, so she had a journey of the shadow barons. And if I remember correctly, that's actually a story based on, I think it's her mother-in-law's mm. uh, trip by sea to somewhere. Uh, she's got a really another interesting one called to nowhere and back. And that's another tale of time travel, although it's more of what you'd call a time slip. It's about this rather lonely girl. She's an only child. And as she's walking around this land of this new place her parents have moved her to, she starts kind of slipping into this alternate world where she meets a girl named Elizabeth who's got this big, huge family, six or seven siblings. And she starts interacting with them and really getting this feel of this love from this big family, thinking it's all wonderful. But during the course of the book, they lose a baby to, you know, some illness. And so it's it's a very poignant story. And again, it's a story of her learning that sometimes we think we have it better, we think we have it worse. But when you start really understanding other times, other places, you realize that sometimes other people do have it better and sometimes they have it much worse. Mm -hmm. And you start to maybe appreciate the good that you have. Interesting. And so why would you recommend uh, Margaret Anderson's In the Keep of Time to our viewers and any readers? Um, it's just, it's such a vivid story of the history of, I'll never forget James of the Fiery Face. I mean, I almost feel from the time I read her description of that battle, it was almost as if I was there. It was so vivid and powerful. So you learn a lot about the time, you learn a lot about human nature, and yet it's all just in a very well-told, easy-read story. That's amazing. And speaking of vivid and powerful, now we get to think about your books for just a second. How did Margaret Anderson influence your writing? Well, um, I think anybody who reads the two books would see some kind of obvious connections. Um, in her books, the siblings go into the tower and they come out in a different century. In my book, two men go into a tower. Of course, you know, one is in the modern day, one is in medieval times, and they both come out the wrong time. They switch times. Um, but it's the same concept of going up into a medieval tower and coming out the wrong time. And I think that Margaret Anderson's book, In the Keep of Time, was probably the first book I ever read about time travel. Um, there were a couple of other interesting ones. Um, there's one called Andrew's Attic. That's also a children's novel about um, how these two boys who look alike kind of switch places in time by going into the attic and that's there's a really interesting twist to that one and there's another one about a girl who goes through a mirror and i can't remember the name of that book um you know what i looked it up recently i can't remember though um but i think margaret's was maybe the first and maybe the very best and it's just a, an absolutely fascinating concept at least to me it is and was from the time i read this of experiencing what other people have lived like. And so there were other factors in the writing of my books. For instance, as you know, <laughs> I play trombone, or at least I used to. And so working on a song called Blue Bells of Scotland played into the writing of my book. This flash of an image of a man gambling away his trombone, his livelihood, and then conning his girlfriend into giving him her grandmother's heirloom ring to, to get it back. Um, these were some things that played into it, but Margaret's book obviously was a very powerful um, foundation stone. And inspiration story. as mm -hmm. well, as your books are also inspirational tales of redemption, as was uh, Margaret Anderson's book. Well, that's really marvelous to hear about in the keep of time. And I've always been fascinated about how she really did set the stage for your writing career as well, which has gone into so many areas, as yeah. we saw earlier, with poetry, with uh, books about supernatural events, and of course, with the ultimate Bluebells Chronicles and all the wonderful books that are there and the wonderful characters that are there as well. So what I'd like to reference at this point is to check out some of our previous podcasts, uh, in particular, the one on the medieval steak pie, 
I thought was uh, some of our best work uh, in terms of, I mean, a lard and butter based pie crust with wonderful meat and spices in it. How can you do better than that in the winter? Our uh, wonderful podcast on C.S. Lewis, I thought was uh, very good. And um, we also have a a fascinating and I think hilarious piece on companion gardening. (laughs) If you didn't think vegetables were funny, aside from veggie tales, you will find this particular piece to be hilarious. And how can you not tell some corny jokes? (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Those jokes will hit you right in the bean. So peace, peace. (laughs) Peace, world peace. (laughs) Over, Over such things. And then, of course, our broadcast on uh, the tales of things beyond our world, the wonderful uh, book that we have that speaks to supernatural tales. Um, So upcoming, we have a couple of different things. One is another recipe from Laura's medieval cookbook slash wonderful book about her her books as well. And we may be mispronouncing this, but we think it's pronounced Leches Fries or Leches Fries. It's a medieval dessert with apples, currants, raisins, dates, a lot of very interesting things in it, along with spice. So we'll get to exercise that uh, lard and butter crust again for a wonderful medieval treat. And then uh, a really good piece that will be coming up is one on hydroponic gardens. Um, Laura bought me a wonderful hydroponic garden kit for Christmas, and our plants are already coming up after we built it, I think on Christmas Day, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, these wonderful seedlings have started to show us that we're going to have some salad in the middle of winter fresh off of this wonderful hydroponic garden. So look forward to that episode as we uh, actually bring you pictures of every seedling coming up out of this individual cups. Yes, we've been taking pictures day by day and in fact sometimes several times a day they're growing so fast so we'll be doing a time-lapse series of clips on, on how these plants are growing. Well I will drink to that and I will drink to our wonderful podcast here on Margaret Anderson's In the Keep of Time and how this has led to Laura's wonderful work as well. So thank you so much and we'll see you soon on Wordsmiths and a Wolfhound, the happiness through arts and self-sufficiency in contrast with my ability to read my notes. (laughs) Thank you so much. Cheers again. (laughs)